And uh, the amazing forest that we're talking about tonight is on Wurundjeri, Wadarong and Jajawurrung land. I extend my respect to their elders past and present and to all First Nations people attending tonight. Um, as mentioned, we are recording tonight's um, presentation, so be conscious of that. Please keep your microphones on mute throughout the presentation, um, except for our wonderful presenters. Um, we'll have some time for some Q&A for all of our speakers at the end of the talk, so please pop any questions that come into your head into the chat, and Sarah will collate those and fire them at us later on. Um, depending on timing and how many questions we get, we might not be able to answer all of them tonight, of course, but we will keep track of them and, and we'll get back to you over the next week with, with answers to your questions. Um, also keep an eye on the chat for some relevant links and information as we go, uh, relevant to what we're all talking about. Um, and we'd also like to especially thank uh, all of our donors and supporters. Um, as a not-for-profit, we rely on on their generosity and support and none of the work we do would be possible um, without you. So for those of you who aren't as familiar with the area, uh, this is kind of where the wombat is in the Victorian context, the northwest of Melbourne. Uh, and this map shows uh, the area with labelled as a national park, which has been promised um, by the Victorian state government, but not yet legislated. And so we're gonna hear more about this from Gail Osborne uh, of Wombat Forest Care, who has been at the forefront of the campaign to legislate this national park. So over to you, Gail. Thank you, thanks. And thanks everyone for joining us and good evening. Um, so the United Nations International Day of Forests is what we're celebrating today. And it has an aim to reduce deforestation and degradation. And here in the Wombat Forest, we've been working for over 20 years to protect the forest from destruction from logging and from many other dangerous, dangerous, damaging and dangerous activities. Um, so the Wombat Forest is approximately 45,000 hectares and it includes, as Chris said, the lands of the Wurundjeri, Wathurong and Dajurong peoples. So we've been working with the Victorian National Parks Association um, to lobby the government, and back in those days, it was um, the Honourable Lily D'Ambrosio when she was Minister for the, for the Environment, for a Victorian Environment Assessment Council report into the Wombat, Mount Cole and the Pyrenees State Forests. And so that process has um, occurred and the Victorian Environment Assessment Council recommended three new national parks. And 18 months later, the government undertook to legislate those. But that was nearly three years ago. So we're still campaigning for these parks, and in particular, the Wombat Lerderdurg National Park, and for the end of the destructive salvage logging that's still occurring in our forest. Um, so next slide. Um, so the Wombat Forest and the adjoining Lerderdurg State Park form a very important area of largely intact Indigenous vegetation in a landscape that's mainly been cleared of the original vegetation. And despite a history of intense logging and gold mining, they're areas of really high quality vegetation, particularly this one here along a waterway. Um, next slide. So the forest supports um, a really good population of endangered greater gliders. And next, um, next slide. Yes, there we go. Um, powerful owls. And so this one um, has its prey, which is a ringtail possum. And the powerful owls in our forest are, are all breeding. So everything's quite healthy in so many areas of the forest, and that's why it's deserving of being a national park. So thanks, everyone. Our next speaker is, is Trevor Spears from Wombat Forest Care as well. And um, Trevor is going to speak to us about another one of the forest's 
uh, important and um, really exciting uh, occupants, the, the barking owls, which are um, a threatened species in Victoria. And yeah, Trevor has got a very sharp ear, ear and eye for birds of the forest. And um, yeah, he'll tell us about his experience finding, finding uh, these breeding owls in the forest. Thanks, Trevor. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Um, yeah. These um, these pair of barking owls. They're, they were found. Well, we were lucky to find them. Actually, they're sort of northwest of Dalesford. We were. Um, I think we were coming home from putting out some motion sensor cameras, and we just saw this sort of bit of forest. Um, it looked pretty good for barking owl habitat. So um, I went back with a song meter and um, left it out there probably two weeks. And on the very last morning, I picked it up. Um, I heard these, uh, there was a male barking owl calling. It's unbelievable, really. Couldn't believe it. But it must have been close by, but just come closer to the song meet on that morning. Um, so it's pretty, it's good habitat for barking owls. It's uh, woodland forests abutting cleared land, which sort of suits their uh, feeding habits. Um, next slide, thanks, Chris. That's the male on the right, sorry. It's the bigger, the bigger bird there. So that's uh, the nest tree where they bred. So that year we found them. We found them in May and they bred. Oh, the chicks probably left them nest in about late September, early October. So as you can see, it's um, reasonably open. We collected a lot of um, pellets, which are regurgitated um, bones and hair and fur underneath some roost trees. I think we collected about 15 or 16 pallets and had them analysed and sort of came up with the same thing that we thought that owls would eat, barking owls eat, mainly rabbits, uh, medium-sized, well, small medium-sized birds like um, galahs, that sort of thing, small parrots. And uh, I think there was a sugar glider there as well. So they need this open this open sort of country where they, in late um, summer and autumn, they do a lot of... Um, hawking of moths and that sort of thing. So they need a bit of open country as well. And the next slide, thanks, uh, Chris. So this is a chick that was born, I think it was, it was probably just out of the hollow about a day or two before that. It was, um, remember we hear, I think we heard it in the hollow a couple of days previous and then it must have just come out. So it was very vulnerable there up in the uh, branches, a windy day too, if I remember. So those first few days when they leave the nest, it's uh, very vulnerable. Um, so those those uh, large trees are candle barks. They had some good hollows. Uh, we I think we came across them. Was COVID was at the time it was twenty twenty. Uh, they bred that year. They had two chicks. The next year they had one chick. Uh, the next the following season they didn't breed. Or if they did, the chicks didn't um, leave the nest. They didn't fledge. And this year I didn't think they bred, but um, they did turn up with a chick in November, so I think they must have bred just around somewhere, maybe on private land or another part of the forest. So um, <clears throat> that's good. So they're, they're, they're breeding well. And uh, the next uh, slide, thanks, Chris. So that's uh, two chicks. That was, they might be about uh, three weeks after they left the nest. That's the male with them. Uh, yeah, that was... After a couple, of, after a few, about a week, I suppose the the, the parents hide them better amongst the the, uh, the trees, so they're harder to detect. Really, uh, over that part of the forest, it's a lot of longleaf box and um, red box, so they're pretty well hidden. They're very hard to find. That's why I took the song meter out. Um, the song meter is just a small device, so you can record, you can set it up at different times of the of the night, um, usually before dusk and for an hour after dusk and about an hour before dawn is the best time for owls, for recording owls, finding if they're calling. So, so but yeah, I was very lucky to find them. And that's the whole family. Um, as you see here, the, that's the female above looking at the camera. She was always very alert. The male was more uh, sleepy, didn't seem to worry too much when Gail and I were there looking at them. Um, so the, the two chicks, it's... They, they stay with the adults for about four to five months after leaving the nest hollow. And um, adults feed them, of course. But then once they once they, uh, they leave that, the adults, the adults will push them away. That's when it gets tricky. They've got to um, either find a territory with a, breed, a 
uh, partner or establish their own territory. So it's um, the first year of the leading this is probably the most difficult for barking owls. Um, as Chris said, they're threatened, critically endangered in Victoria. I think the last, I think they said there's about 100 pair, but it's probably more than that in Victoria. They seem to be doing um, okay in Shilton, that area, in the Grampians. But um, in the Wombat, it's hard to know. They do love that that drier area, whereas um, interface with cleared land. But they could be they could be the north of the Wombat around that um, Kangaroo Creek area. I wouldn't be surprised a pair. There's a I believe there's a pair in Hanging Rock. So even up towards the cables, I'm sure there'd be a pair somewhere. But they're pretty hard to track down. And I think. Chris has got a couple of calls these that I recorded. I recorded these with a song meter, I think, or it might have been just a I've got a shotgun microphone. I can't remember which I use now, but because the barking owl's got a scream, they do scream often in winter. And yeah, I was lucky enough to pick up this scream. So Chris might be able to pay. Plus, I think the first the first call is um, just a pair and a chick trilling at the same time. So if you could play that one for us, Chris would be good. Yeah, so I hope that, that sound came through all right. Yeah, no, it's good, Chris. Yeah. So good. The We're not just sitting blind. The deeper cool is the uh, male. That's the, um, and the, of course, the trick. trick <laughs> Yeah, so it's amazing that scream. I'm, I'm sure it would send the shivers up plenty of campers if they're um, close by. Yeah. So. <laughs> but yeah, they usually do that in uh, early in the season or winter, probably June, July. But yeah, so that's a, that's about the barking owl. So um, yeah, great bird. We're lucky to have them in the forest, and they're just on the edge, really. But they did breed inside the forest, which is uh, <coughs> fantastic. So thanks a lot, Chris. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Trevor. Um, so, and yeah, Trevor is an absolute wealth of knowledge about um, particularly the birds of the area. So definitely uh, reach out to him if you're a keen birder. Um, so I'm going to summarise some work that was carried out by Zach Atkins, Nick Clemen, and Michael Amore, along with Gail and Trevor uh, on this little skink. So unfortunately, um, None of the researchers who were involved with this stuff are available to present tonight, so I'm going to do my best to um, hopefully make sense of some of this stuff. Um, these photos are all taken by Gail, and I should have mentioned earlier, all the photos throughout this presentation uh, up to this point, unless they've been credited otherwise, were all Gail's photos. Um, so a big thanks to Gail for sharing those. So these images are all of mountain skinks. Uh, they're an endangered species that occur in... Uh, the ACT, New South Wales and Victoria. And up until recently, the westernmost population of the mountain skink was thought to be uh, in the upper Yarra Valley, so about 100 k's east of Melbourne. Um, before, I think two or three years ago, being discovered in the Wombat Forest, uh, so 50 k's west of Melbourne. So this population's uh, quite severely geographically isolated from other known populations, which uh, is a factor that's, that has significant impacts on their conservation story. Um, as a species, they're, they're threatened by, by logging, uh, they're threatened by habitat destruction, um, climate change through a loss of suitable habitat range, and also through increased fire frequency and severity, uh, and invasive predators. So, um, so many of the, of the common sort of threats that, that our threatened species are facing. Uh, but as part of this work, genetic samples were taken from 26 sites in total across the Skinks range, uh, including nine areas within the Wombat. So the first kind of key result that 
uh, is really interesting for this species is depending on which analysis method was used. Um, so the researchers used a couple of different analyses on the genetics um, of the population. Uh, there are either three or five distinct genetic populations of mountain skinks. Um, but in either case, whether you take the three or the five, uh, the wombat forest population showed up as a discrete sort of cluster, meaning that they are clearly distinct genetically from the rest of the mountain skinks populations. Um, and so if that, that has implications for uh, things like gene flow across the landscape. Um, so the species as a whole actually has quite a good level of genetic diversity, higher than um, some similar threatened skink species. But at each of those five individual population levels, uh, the genetic diversity within those populations is significantly lower than that of the whole species. And so each of those little populations, um, they've got nowhere to go and they are at risk of, of things like inbreeding depression um, by having too low a genetic diversity. The Wombat Forest population seems to be really important in this overall species picture. So they contain about 20% of the total unique alleles or um, genetic diversity effectively of, of the mountain skink. So 20% of the unique diversity across the whole species occurs in the wombat. And that was the second highest amount out of the five populations. It also had the lowest uh, level of signs of inbreeding of all the populations. So they're in quite a healthy um, genetic state from that point of view. So basically these two bits of information mean that if, if this wombat forest population of mountain skinks was lost, which we didn't even know existed until a few years ago, um, this whole species would immediately lose a massive chunk of its genetic diversity. And this is really important for the species from a conservation perspective as climate is changing for a species that's quite um, susceptible to impacts of climate change because they're generally a high elevation species. So they're, they're more well adapted to cooler temperatures and um, almost alpine environments in part of their range. Um, the fact that the wombat forest is the lowest elevation that any of these populations occur at as well, um, you know, may suggest that some of these genetic differences that we're seeing in the wombat might be linked to the species being able to cope better at uh, the types of conditions that we get at lower elevations. And those are the types of conditions that we're seeing more and more up at higher elevations with climate change. So that means that the genetics that this species, uh, this population, contains could be really important for future conservation work where you might be translocating individuals between the populations to mix their genetics up to allow them to adapt better basically to a to a changing climate um, or even for things like captive breeding programs to to mix the genetics between populations and and reintroduce individuals um, so yeah, from a conservation perspective for this species, which is a, a federally listed endangered species, the wombat forest population is incredibly important. Um, but the most important conservation action, you know, as much as um, it's, it's kind of fun to talk about things like translocations and, and captive breeding and reintroducing animals, uh, the most important thing we can do at the moment for this species is to protect these five remaining populations, uh, which means minimising threatening processes. So that's things like logging, inappropriate fire regimes and, and invasive species. So some of the really common threats that we see across um, Central Victoria and, and Australia as a whole. So I will hand over now to John Walter from Armsbury um, Landcare. I think that's the hat he's wearing for this project uh, to talk about some of the work he's been involved with over the last few years uh, and the amazing overall biodiversity of the Wombat Forest. Take it away, John. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, well, firstly, I think I'd like to uh, just recognise that the work that I've been involved in on in the Wombat Forest is relatively new. So we started in 2017 in the Wombat Forest and Gail and Trevor and uh, the people of the Wombat Forest Care have been doing this sort of activity for some decades, I think it would run into now. And... Uh, I really appreciate the work that's happening there with you know greater gliders, fasca gales, um, powerful owls, as well as as the things that you've seen today. Um, the images from here on in, I think, are all mine except for one, um, which I'll, I will point out when I get to that one. Um, but my focus uh, with Marsbury Landcare is within uh, in that map on the right. You'll see the the red 
bordered area. Um, that's probably the main focus of the works of Marsbury Landcare. And we're focusing on Kangaroo Creek, which runs into Marsbury Reservoir and some of those middle sections around the reservoirs of uh, the Colliban River. The area in the green square uh, is, I suppose, what you're seeing in that other map on the left. And the purple star uh, is where we'll go to in a moment uh, when we start looking at some of the early works that we did. Um, when you look at the map on the left, you'll see the area in green is the actual Wombat State Forest north of the Spring Hill Road. Uh, well, the Spring Hill Road runs, runs through the, the bottom section of it. And a lot of our survey activity has been in that, that northernmost section of the Wombat Forest. So, uh, the other thing to note, of course, is that there are three reservoirs on that map on the right. And uh, those reservoirs draw their water from the Wombat State Forest. And that system has been the water supply for Bendigo and Castlemaine for 150 plus years. So, it's a pretty important uh, area and catchment um, for uh, the future of our inland communities. So we'll have a look at that area of the Purple Star. If you go to the next slide, Chris. So this, this is that area, Chinaman Track, uh, where it crosses Kangaroo Creek. And you can see there in April 2017, um, it was completely overgrown with gorse. Um, there was 8.5 hectares of gorse, um, two metres or two metres plus in height throughout that whole section of the forest. Um, the whole area there is actually an endangered EVC, uh, Herbridge Creek Line Woodland. Uh, it was the EVC. And there's populations of greater gliders in the trees above all of this gorse area. There's been a, uh, an area of interest to me since probably 2008 when I first went in there and discovered what was happening with this gorse. Um, so it's sort of been uh, sitting on my agenda of, of places to get to one day if I ever had the opportunity. And just going back to the reservoirs in the previous slide, because of the reservoirs and because of the water there, um, there's a program uh, put together by North Central CMA, Catchment Management Authority and Colliban Water, where they're doing work to try and improve the water quality uh, from the inflow into those reservoirs. And that has very fortunately led to um, funding opportunities for groups like Landcare to, uh, uh, to, to attract and to work on these areas. Um, it took more than a year working with DELP to actually get to work in this area. But if you go to the next slide, um, it, I suppose in, to some eyes, it might look as though a bomb has just hit that site. Um, but this is after the gorse was taken out or was groomed back down. And you can see it's quite quite a substantial difference. Um, the uh, image in the top right is actually a two metre tall remains of a chimney, a substantial chimney. Um, even though I had visited the site and walked all over it multiple times, I had never even come across this chimney. It was completely overgrown and hidden by gorse. Um, so we made all sorts of physical discoveries once the gorse itself was gone. If you go to the next slide. Um, so there we are in 2022, um, same location, but some natural regeneration occurring. And um, you can see, if you think back to that first slide where it was wall to wall gorse, it's quite a dramatic transformation. Um, so the, as I said, the area has greater gliders in the trees above, um, and we've now got the opportunity to see some of the other plants coming back through. Um, we are still working in there, um, in, in another week or so, we'll be doing another pass through this exact area that you see there, um, taking out seedlings of gorse that have come back in. And it's not just that area, but we're working on there and, um, it's another six or seven kilometres of waterway downstream from there to the end of the state forest is the area that we've been managing over the last few years. And next, next one. Part of the uh, project uh, included a whole lot of biodiversity related surveys. Um, so some of the funding uh, and most of the money actually has gone in that gorse management that we control, but 
as part of the project, we do a lot of in-kind work as well. And the in-kind contribution has been in the form of surveys. So flora surveys, um, you can see there the blue line, for example, there's Kangaroo Creek and you've got other colored lines. They're the different waterways that feed into Kangaroo Creek. So we've done flora surveys along all of those waterways. Um, and I can just give you some idea of the results of that. Um, and we started the flora surveys actually right up in the headwaters at Little Hampton and worked our way downstream through the end of the state forest. But uh, in all, we ended up with 205 flora species. You can see there I've got some fungi. I have a bit of an interest in fungi. So I, I didn't deliberately seek out fungi, but I did pick up um, casual observations and that amounted to another 87 species of fungi. And um, in our other surveys, we picked up 70 species of fauna, not including insects. And this actually includes 173 species that were not previously previously listed on the Atlas of Living Australia as being present within the area. So it's just an example of um, how doing this sort of work, uh, the information that you can gain uh, on local areas is is extremely valuable because there's so little um, quality records available of of what's in the different areas. So our our next slide. Um, something I should have mentioned there. Um, outside of this area, the wombat forest, of course, is, is, is known for having lots and lots of uh, threatened species and powerful owl and greater glider, as you can see there, and so on, are, are among those. But there's also uh, things like the wombat bossier, a whole host of other flora species, and, and even uh, threatened species of fungi that have been recorded in there. Um, there are three Australian species of fungi that are listed with the IUCN red list uh, as endangered species, two of which occur in the Wombat State Forest. Um, and for a good many years, the only location for those two species was the Wombat State Forest, but one of them has since been found um, east of Melbourne as well, and that's the... Uh, or as kelpium species, but the other one is a sarcodon. So of our three endangered species um, that are currently listed, two of them occur in the wombat forest. Another example of, of what you can find when you go looking in this sort of country um, is a cordonaria species that was previously only known to occur in Myrtle Beach Forest. So in Tasmania, northeast of Melbourne, you had this unusual, rather stinky cordonarius fungus. Um, and I found a population of that in the Wombat State Forest uh, in basically messmate country, completely different habitat altogether. So it's little finds like that are changing the way the scientists have to think and understand how these uh, uh, organisms function and work. Uh, so part of it was the spotlighting program as well, which is what you're seeing some of the results of here. Um, our target species was greater gliders. Uh, and we made numerous records, particularly in that area north of the Spring Hill Road. And we actually extended the the known habitat of greater gliders into that area of the forest. So they do come right up to the extreme edge of the wombat forest country. But a few other species in there. And I mentioned a photograph of someone else. So the little agile antichinus that you see in the center circle, uh, top center circle, um, that's actually Chris's photo. We were out recently... Uh, doing some spotlighting on private land that, that adjoins the forest in this area. And um, it, it, I suppose this this was maybe four, five metres up on a limb in a tree. And like you just don't ever, ever expect to spotlight animals like this in the forest. Um, and things like feather tail gliders and so on. We also got a feather tail glider that night. But we used um, the uh, thermal... Uh, thermal imaging scopes, and that's really become an essential tool when you're going out spotlighting these days. You take a thermal imaging scope and you're scanning through looking for, for thermal hotspots, and then you slip back into normal spotlighting methods from there to sort of pick up and record what the species is. Um, but it's really creating opportunities to find these small mammals that you would never, ever see under normal circumstances. Um so moving on from there, we go to our frog surveys. 
And this this is this is a really interesting little thing. There was a record you can see in the centre, a Vibrans toadlet, or sometimes called a brown toadlet, endangered species. There was a record for this uh, in the Wombat Forest near Mudlark Road and Swaby's Road. And when we were planning the surveys and seeking funding for this, I wrote into our grant application that we would undertake some frog surveys to try and locate or relocate this record. And unfortunately, about a week before uh, the survey was to occur, I took a really good close look at this record and realised that it actually had been misplotted. It wasn't from the Wombat Forest at all. It actually was from near Ye to the northeast of Melbourne. And someone had got their 143, 144s mixed up and plotted it incorrectly. But we had already engaged ecologists. We had everything lined up. Um, we had sites selected, and you can see four of the sites in those outer circles. Um, so we're all ready to roll, and I arranged to meet the ecologist at a particular intersection. And uh, we were going to lead them into the forest and do the surveys from there. And it just so happens he, he got out of his car and we sort of stopped to chat before we moved on. And he sort of raised his hand to his ear and said, well, um, I can hear them calling here, John. And now this is gorse infested, former pine forest wasteland. And they were living in under the gorse and in the ditch on the side of the road at, at this sort of randomly chosen spot on the edge of the forest. And we dutifully went and surveyed all of our other select, carefully selected nice habitat areas, found other frogs, but didn't find any of the, the bibber and I there. The only place we record them was in this rather um, fortuitous meeting place. Um, so you never know what you're going to find when, you, when you're going out doing surveys, I suppose is the point from there. So the last part of our um, survey component was actually setting up cameras. And I uh, partnered with Wombat Forest Care for that uh, part of the project. So we set up cameras pretty much every third Sunday for a year. We were out uh, putting cameras out or retrieving cameras and relocating tram cameras. But what became fairly apparent was there was a lot of birds to see on the way. So our Sunday mornings usually became bird watching opportunities um, as we wandered around picking up and relocating cameras. Uh, and the odd koala and things as well. Next one, please, Chris. And there we're seeing some of the camera results. Um, our target species with the cameras was the Fascagal, as you can see in the top left, but you know, obviously Antichinus, um, both mountain and common brush tile possums, uh, mountain on the left-hand side. And you can see some of that forest there to the north of the Spring Hill Road in the background. And the camera locations are sites where we physically recorded Fasca Gales. And uh, the GG is obviously where the spotlighting had recorded greater gliders. And we've got situations there where we've got uh, greater gliders recorded at night in the trees and Fasca Gales being recorded, you know, within 10 metres of the tree on the cameras as well. So having two in, uh, endangered species in such close proximity was a real thrill to be able to prove and show that uh, these species are, are existing there and, and surviving quite well. Um, just some numbers on, on the, uh, uh, I've lost my piece of paper there now, there we go. A few numbers for you on the, uh, on the cameras. So in all, uh, we recorded 29 species on the cameras in all. And the Fasca Gale was almost 6% of those uh, 598 individual records, and 6% of those were Fasca Gales, which was quite a, quite a good number. It's not, not surprising that the highest uh, recorded species was the Black Wallaby, and that was roughly 30% of species was the Wallaby. And what did we have? We had uh, Agile Antichinus was almost 13%. And mountain brush tail possum was 11%. So there's quite significant numbers of um, a wide variety of, of our fauna sort of living within that area. Uh, just the next slide. Thanks, Chris. Okay. So you can see there's not really any shortage of, of um, treasures and things to find within the Wombat State Forest. Um, 
And what we're currently doing now is a, a whole series of insect surveys and setting up light sheets and so on. And just some examples there, we recently did one uh, at Kangaroo Creek near where the uh, spotlighting occurred and we got 145 species, I think it was there. A couple of months later, we did one a bit further north. We got 143 species on that one. And just over a week ago, just to the south of Trentham, um, I did a light sheet for Wombat Forest Care. And my estimation at this stage, we're still processing the images, but my estimation there was 293 species that we recorded in, in that, uh, that session on the light sheet. So the amount of, or the opportunity to find interesting and exciting species is, is pretty amazing, um, especially when you get into the world of insects. And just as an example of that, there's two insects there. So the green moth in the center, um, that's a cymatoplex species. That's the only specimen ever recorded of that. And that just flew into the walls of my house one night because I left the lights on and I just happened to be there and take a photograph of it. It's now collected and it's in the, in the Victorian Museum as a specimen, but it's not known and recorded anywhere else at this stage. The uh, purple one with the orangey head, um, that again came into the walls of my house, but that um, was the first record of that species in Victoria. Um, not recorded uh, now, it's, since then, it's been recorded in a few other locations and now actually recorded in Tasmania as well. But locating the species, identifying it, putting it up on something like iNaturalist, and that allows opportunities for others to then say, oh, hang on, I've seen that. And now we're starting to get records coming out because people can put a name to something. Uh, it helps um, raise awareness about that particular species. Um, and I suppose that's really the key takeaway I'd like people to sort of get from tonight is um, you can see that there's countless treasures to be found within the wombat forest and, and probably all places if you go out and go looking. And I encourage everybody to to go out there and see what you can find. Take a photo, take two, take three, put them up on iNaturalist. And that way we're helping to get this information out to the officials. And you might think that it's the responsibility of a, of a good government to undertake research on what species are occurring where, but um, this does happen. Occasionally this does happen. But it's always been the private enthusiasts who have been key to understanding the real diversity and, and the secrets of our local forests. And I, I can't I can't encourage you more uh, than to, to get out, take a camera and see what you can find. And you'll be amazed because there's stuff everywhere. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, John. Um, thanks again to Gail and Trevor as well. Um, we hopefully have some time for some questions. Just a reminder, if you haven't already, feel free to pop questions in the chat. And if we can't get to them tonight, we will follow up with you. Um, and yeah, if you would like to keep up to date with, with what we're doing, um, please do subscribe to our uh, newsletter and things like that. Um, follow our socials, all of that. And yeah, thanks again to our supporters. Um, couldn't do what we do without you. So over to you, Sarah, to um, run us through some questions. Uh, John, the first one is, uh, it's quite a dramatic transformation after the gorse control. Was any consideration given to the possibility of the gorse providing weedy habitat for native wildlife, such as breeding and refuge sites for small birds and bandicoots, etc.? Any re-veg with native prickly shrubs to replace the gorse? Uh, uh, there, well, there is um, naturally occurring native prickly shrubs nearby. Um, we haven't done any re-veg within that particular site. Um, we're letting the natural regeneration do its thing uh, and it's coming back really, really strongly. Um, there's quite a wide mix of species in there. Um, I, I don't think that there's any real threat to uh, um, local local species. Um, if, if you... if where those photographs were taken, if I was to turn 180 degrees and look downstream, uh, you would see quite dense cover uh, and plenty of protection and so on. Um, the the gorse was pretty devastating in that particular section, but it, there's, there's plenty of plenty of good cover around. 
uh, we're not planning any revenge. It's not not something that's that's on our on our agenda in there. Um, I think nature will do a much better job of it than we would. Uh, and just another one for John. Um, what tree species were the Fascagales found near? Um, I don't think that there's um, a particular tree species. Um, Fascagales don't have the claws that will work uh, uh, climbing gums, and, and they do like to hunt sort of they, they, they are partly arboreal in their hunting um, so they won't climb gums so they do like stringy barks um, so mess mates obviously is probably a, mess mates and narrow leaf pepmints are probably the dominant species in those particular areas uh, along with some uh, a mixture mixture of some gums there are some candle barks there'll be some uh, manna gums uh, and another species mountain grey gum also occurs in the area I don't think the tree species is necessarily important um, for getting records of them because they'll forage over a fairly wide area. Um, being uh, around runways, you know, old logs, fallen timber, those sorts of things is really important because a lot of the smaller mammals use those as, as pathways effectively uh, through the forest. Um, so that's that's usually what one of the things that we're looking for when we're setting up uh, camera sites. Uh, and I've got one for Trevor here. Why do you think the barking owls have managed to hang on in the northern wombat forests when they are no longer found in so much of Victoria? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, well, I'm not sure how well they're going over there. It's, I know there's another pair about uh, 20k away. Um, but it's probably mainly habitat, habitat loss, I suppose. All those hollow-bearing trees, those woodland sort of trees that have been knocked over. Um, but yeah, through central Victoria up to Maryborough, I know there's a couple of pair up there too. But yeah, they're pretty scarce. Um, they, well, I suppose they lost a lot of that um, those that food supply, like squirrel gliders were one of their main foods back before um, yeah, wild settlers apparently. But, but rabbits are a big part of their, their food now. So yeah, not sure. Mainly habitat loss, I'd say, would be the big thing there. So. But yeah, they're hanging on, but how well they're going, how well the, the juveniles, whether they last to breed and that, it's, it's too hard to tell. So hopefully they do, they make a, make a go of it. Uh, I, I just much see there's a, a question there on, on, sorry, see there's a question there on the bait, which Gail has responded to on the bait. The reason we partnered with Wombat Forest Care uh, was because I know Gail um, worked very hard to, to have all the appropriate permits involved. And, you know, you can put cameras out uh, and, and leave them unbaited and, and, and hope for the best. But if you really want to get a good understanding of what's there, you do need to, to have baited cam, uh, cameras to sort of get a, a good understanding of what wildlife is in the area. Um, so we partnered intentionally and deliberately with Wombat Forest Care uh, because all of those appropriate permits were in place, uh, which allowed us to get a good understanding of what was happening. Yeah, that's a really good and important point there. Uh, uh, there was just a question about any future assessments being done at Mount Cole, uh, the burnt areas. Um, I'm not sure if anybody can answer that question. Probably would Gail know anything about that? No, no, it's one of the saddest things you can imagine. The, it's hard to imagine the loss of animal life in that fire, just unbelievably horrible. And the fire has um, gone through areas of um, the Mount Cole Gravillia that's critically endangered. Until people can get back up there, um, we won't know whether we've lost whole populations or whether there's a few plants hanging on somewhere. So, yeah, um, because because we fought very, very hard to get the VIAC um, investigation to cover Mount Cole and the Pyrenees, 
And when I spoke to Lisa Neville, when she was minister about, she said we could have a VIAC investigation for Mount Cole, for the wombat. And I said, oh, but what about Mount Cole? And she just snapped, send me a three-pager and walked away. And I thought we'd lost everything. And so I took Lily D'Ambrosio to agree to include Mount Cole and the Pyrenees in this investigation. And there is the recommendation that it should be a national park. Um, so, well, part of it to be a national park, it would be a new Buanga, Mount Buanga National Park. So it would join on to the already the state park that's there. Um, yeah, it's devastating, really. Thanks. Just have a few questions, maybe just one more question um, before we wrap up. Uh, just about having barking owls on people's property and what they should do and if it's worth getting a song meter to confirm and how would they go about that. Trevor? I'll answer that. Log they should tail. get in touch with Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll pop out there and um, he'll find them for you. No, no if I can't get there, it's, um, they're pretty reliable. They always call, nearly always call about... Um, 20 minutes before dusk, I reckon. If the, especially at this time of year, to well, May, June, July, they'll they'll definitely if they're there, they'll definitely call. Even if it's not a bark, it'll be a grumble or something like that. You'll, but they're very reliable. If they, if they find a habitat that they like, they'll just stay there forever. Yeah, you know, for years, if it suits all their needs. Um, but yeah, you just got to get out there before dusk or maybe an hour before dawn <laughs> in the middle of winter. Do you know? Flowing on from that, Trevor, do you know if there's any um, examples of them using nest boxes or do they only use natural hollows? Yeah, I never heard that one, Chris. Um, mm. yeah, I would say probably only natural hollows, but I know they can use um, rabbit burrows if they're desperate or even um, in rocky cliffs or something, if there's a hole there. But not, not sure about nest boxes. I know, I don't think powerful owls, they might use them occasionally. I think someone did some stuff up in Sydney on powerful owls, but mm. yeah, I don't know about barking owls, couldn't say. We'll yeah, have to try. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, there was just one more question about um, that an antikinet lives in someone's roof and if you've got any tips um, of what to put in their yard as an alternative nest site. <laughs> Can anyone answer <laughs> that one? <laughs> Mm. Uh, they love roofs. That's yeah. I don't know. They um doesn't seem to matter how much is around. If there's a spot in a roof, they can get into easily. Um, they love it. Yeah. Um, I mean, naturally, they they're pretty flexible with where they den, and that's probably why they end up in roofs. They'll 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 use hollows up a tree. They'll um you know they'll den in hollow logs. They'll den in crevices and things on the ground. Um. Yeah, so any of those types of either ground level features or small hollows um, they'll use. Um, but yeah, they're pretty persistent. If they like a spot, it'll be pretty hard to keep them out. I think that's it. All right, might wrap it up. Might have to wrap it up there then. Thanks again. Um, thanks, Sarah. And um, yeah, Gail, Trevor, John, thanks again for your time. And thanks to everyone who's tuned in. Um, if we have missed any questions, we'll we'll follow up over the next week or so. And um, yeah, this is all recorded. So if you joined late, if you missed anything, or if you want to pass it on to someone you think might be interested, um, it'll be on our website sometime next week, probably. But yeah, thank you. Thank you very thanks, much. Chris. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Sarah.